Hi, my name is Marcus, and this is a companion podcast for the CG Jung Helpdesk Meetup Group. I host live events on Zoom every two weeks about the concepts and ideas of the Swiss psychologist Carl Gustav Jung. Every event, I give a presentation about the Jungian concept, so have fun with this event's topic. And I welcome you to today's event and to today's topic, which is symbols and the third. This is basically the same thing, but the third sounds a little bit mysterious. And this goes back to a very fundamental concept and thought of Jung that he really saw a lot of opposites everywhere. So for him, it's a little bit like in electricity where you have a positive and a negative pole and the tension between them generates motion and light and everything. So by the movement of one plane to another, we get basically an animating spirit, we get life, we get everything. His idea is that these opposites are really acting in an antagonistic manner. So it's similar to the symbol of yin and yang, where, where you have the dry snake and the wet snake, you have the bright and the dark, and those are in competition and contrast to each other. So they are very different, and in their differentness, there has to be conflict. There has to be tension between them. And he really thinks that this is how human beings perceive and see the world. So everything is in context to the rest in an oppositional matter. So you can't really talk about high when you don't have a low. You can talk about bright when you don't have a dark. So talking about one thing implies always the existence of the other. The concept of yin, then it would be yang, and the other way around also. And this can be pretty well expressed and is seen very, very often, this oppositional manner and storytelling. So I found a lot of examples about this, where it's often called juxtaposition or irony or just contrast, where you see always that you have two strong forces opposing each other. So it's always pretty abstract when you say it like this, and they say, oh, it's good against evil. But as soon as you have opposites and they are together, things happen. And this, very often the story happens. So in the movie Up, for example, the animated Pixar movie, you have the old man who does not want to have everybody around because his wife died. And then you have the child who really wants to make friends. And the movie is basically about their relationship and how they change through their interaction. On Ferris Bueller's Day Off, you have Ferris who is the popular kid and just pretends to be sick to have a day off and takes his friend Cameron, who is pretty neurotic and lame, to be honest, uh, and they spend the day off Breaking Bad, where you have Walter White and Jesse Pinkman, and one is a teacher, a former teacher, and one is a former student, and they cook math together, but are character-wise very, very different. So you have opposites acting against each other, generating something, generating conflict, and in this way also development. But the problem is when you have these opposite acting against each other and being so different, it's hard to get them together. And this is a problem that Jung contended with in all his thoughts. Because for him, the world consists of opposites, but we're not really able to perceive the opposites. Normally, we're just focusing on one part. And this is what consciousness can really do well for Jung. It can focus on one part of reality and focus only, for example, on the bright, forgetting about the dark, the other way around also. So the further consciousness pushes into one direction and tears apart one opposite in one direction, the other opposite starts acting up and becomes active and tries then to antagonize, to reach back into um, equilibrium. So, and even though that they're opposites, they're very, very close together. Once you push one part further and further, you will at a certain point run into the opposite. That's called anti animodia It's a Greek word. And Jung was very interested in the origin of words because Nietzsche was also interested in the origin of words. And in the English language, where you have this progression of good, better, best, the origin of best is bad. So at a certain point, 
when you reach the extreme, you get into the opposite. And that happens all by itself. And when you have, for example, the very strong opposite of male and female, and you want to combine those again, like all the opposites, and they can't really meet on the same field because they're two polar opposite of each other. There has to be an intermediate. And this intermediate is for Jung the third. So when you combine male and female, you get out a child. <laughs> and in that context, the child would be the third because the child has the parts of the male and the female half-half. So it's a, a bridging between two opposites that could not reunite uh, through other means, but rather through an intermediate who helps. A little bit like a translator. You have two people who only speak their own language and can't communicate with each other. There needs to be some kind of intermediate that's able to mediate and communicate between them that speaks the language of both. And this you have also very often in stories again, where the hero, for example, has qualities which are often very good, but also very bad. For example, in Harry Potter, Harry Potter can speak the language of snakes. And normally, only the bad wizards can do that. But so the hero is a mixture of both, of good and bad. Or Luke Skywalker in Star Wars, he's, he's a Jedi Knight, but he's also the son of Darth Vader, who is the baddest person in the universe. So he has this part also in him. And this combination through a singular person is very often the protagonist and the hero combining both worlds. Another example would be Moses, who was a child of common people, I think of Jewish people, uh, but then he grew up in this household of the pharaohs. So or King Arthur, who grew up poor, but later was found out that he has a secret heritage. So it is really this combination of two different worlds within the hero that he was then uniting them or rather changing them and the world through his actions because of her actions when when a woman by having lived in both worlds and bringing them together as a third as a mediator and for Jung the ultimate opposite was consciousness and unconscious because consciousness is everything that you know that you can do everything that you can relate to each other, everything is connected in a kind of network. Everything fits very nicely. Everything is structured orderly. This is why consciousness, light is very often associated because in light, you can see everything. Everything is clear. Everything is visible. But unconscious is characterized by everything which is not conscious. So it can't be ordered. It can't be brought into connection with the things you know. Everything is strange. Everything is intermingled. There's no clear separation where one thing ends and the other begins. And he says, this is a great dance of psychology that you have your consciousness and consciousness is supposed to grow and develop like a human being uh, develops. When you're a child, you're very small. You can't do anything. You can't talk. You can't walk. You're very dependent on other people. Basically, all you can do is scream. But when you grow up, you get socialized, you learn things, you're able to play more and more complex game with yourself, with others, with the world. And it's this growing of consciousness trying to integrate more and more. So, but how can you really integrate things or come into contact with something which is completely strange and foreign, where you're not even completely sure how to touch it when it comes out of the unconscious? And for Jung, that's the symbol. The symbol is the bridge and the mediator that it's connecting both worlds of the consciousness and of the unconscious. And symbols for Jung are very often images. And these images, he says, are happening and are generated completely naturally, for example, in dreams, very often and automatically. So for him, what is happening is you have all these conscious contents, so the stuff that you know and the things that you are aware of because there's associations when they're inside consciousness. And the unconscious will take those parts and order them and structure them in a way which is weird and create a symbol. So a symbol is something always that's coming out of the unconscious. But 
because it's in the middle, it's a third, it has parts of consciousness in form of these associations and parts of the unconscious, which is more the pattern, the structure. So suddenly a symbol can be very paradoxical or very strange, like a mermaid, for example, which is a combination of a fish and um, a human being. You see that a lot in mythology where you have Medusa or the Hydra or the gods that are mixed together wildly. And the difference between a symbol and a sign, for example, is that a sign reduces complexity of the world and takes out individuality. So when you have a road sign and the road sign says dangerous road, you don't know really why it's dangerous. You're just being told it's dangerous and be careful. But there could be a lot of reasons why it's dangerous. But all the dangerous roads in the world, they get one sign. Or you say, the sign tells you, okay, don't drive faster than 30. But there could be a lot of reasons why you're not allowed to drive faster than 30. It could be school nearby, the road could be bad, or road could be narrow. But that's not important for a sign. The sign is just reducing the complexity of the world. But the symbol, what a symbol does is pointing to something very complex, something unknown. It's just like the dragon's tail. You see part of it, but there's way more behind it. You see a little bit like a first iteration of something. So a symbol gets generated right at this edge of consciousness, the things that you know and you can do. And it's strange mysterious and grasping because you know and your unconsciousness is reacting to it there's something to it this has value for me this is important but you don't know really why it's a little bit like picking up a new hobby or when you read something really interesting and then uh, it linger or you listen to a song that is new and then it starts lingering around in the back of your head or somebody says something there's your unconsciousness telling you oh there's something to unpack there's something to explore and this is the task and the duty of consciousness to unpack things. And symbols are structuring in that way that they get the attention and consciousness is supposed to enact with it and unpack it further and develop it. So a symbol is not completely fixed forever. It can change and modulate based on the situation, based also on what state consciousness has. It's it's like the closest analogy you can have to something. It's, it's like when somebody tries to explain to you, like I do right now, something which is new and weird. There are a lot of examples and a lot of analogies saying, okay, it's something like that, it's something like that, something like that. And this is the exact same thing that the unconsciousness does. It shows you things and say, yeah, look at this. It's a little bit like that. It's this combination. Jung has this example for this analogy making when the uh, Spanish people came to uh, North America for the first time and brought horses with them. That was the first time there were horses in North America. So the people had no idea what a horse, horse is because they never saw it because they're not local to North America. So how the Native Americans would describe it, they would say it's a tall pig <laughs> because they had pigs and a horse it is a little bit like a pig because it has this long nose, it has this pointy ears, and it has a little bit of a tail. So it is some similarity there. And bringing in these similarities is supposed to educate consciousness and bringing it to investigate more into what is really happening there. These symbols can have an individual meaning for the person, of course, but they can also have a collective meaning. For example, in religion, you have a lot of symbology. In Christianity, you have a symbol of the cross, which is a very condensed part about so much of different stories. It's about Jesus. It's about how you're supposed to live your life. It's about the fundamentals of Christianity. And it's all condensed in a symbol that can grab the attention of the people and cause them to put it everywhere. There are also symbols like the swastika of the um, National Socialists, which urges people just to put it everywhere. And it expresses a psychological situation. So it's the unconsciousness 
communicating with consciousness, but that does not necessarily mean that consciousness understands what's happening. Because the interesting thing about the swastika of the Nazis is it's a very old symbol that's thousands of years old, but not in the way how the Nazis drew it. So it can move in two different directions. It can move to the left or to the right. And the interesting thing is when it's moving to the right, which is what you find in India, it's always a very affirming symbol for consciousness. So it's uh, moving toward consciousness when it's moving right. But the Nazi symbol, it was moving to the left. And this movement symbolizes movement into the unconsciousness. So into a less aware, less differentiated, less sophisticated state. So it's very interesting that they chose that symbol to put it everywhere because it's a return to barbarism and rather primitive, unsophisticated psychology, what the National Socialists did. But this is what human beings are experiencing everywhere in their personal life, but also outside. This is symbols coming up and they're really hitting the point of, of the time, like the fish for the Christian age, symbolizing something about the condition of people, how it was back then, the psychological needs. And of course, these symbols can age. <laughs> like the, the cross has not the same meaning or let's say feeling the experience of the cross is not the same as 2000 1000 or 500 years ago this is why these symbols they can age and they can die but they can also be reborn again in a cultural context and the important thing that jung really stresses about this is that you cannot really take symbols literally as they are can be very confusing and very often in paradoxes because it's basically showing the limits of consciousness. It's showing where consciousness is not enough because that's the normal state. Consciousness is not enough. You don't know enough. You don't do enough. You can't perceive enough. All these things. So consciousness is supposed to expand and it's trying to show, okay, these are your limitations. These are the things you have to deal with. And this makes them very different, for example, from Freud in the context of dream interpretation. For Freud, all the things, all the images that come up during dreaming are a facade. So it's always something is hidden. So you don't really care about what you see because it's a facade, a lie anyways. It has no meaning except for being there to distract and to lie to the dreamer. But Jung saw dreams and the images that are generated in dreams as a best approximation of something. It's a horses look like pigs mechanism of saying, okay, yeah, you don't know that yet, but it, it's like this and it will make sense afterwards. <laughs> Where it says, you're dreaming of something, you're experiencing something, but that's not supposed to take, be taken literally, but symbolically. That means it does not stand for itself. There's more behind it. You have to follow the dragon's tail to the rest of the dragon to understand what it's really about. Because a symbol can be very, or image, disagreeable. So you can think that you might kill someone or that you eat something that is, for example, rotten. So this is not to be taken literally as they say, oh, now I have to eat rotten fruit. But rather, it seems to be that needs to be integrated in you that looks disagreeable. So it is this compensatory function of symbols and of the unconscious, which is constantly broadcasting things to consciousness to steer it in certain directions and to bring development and to bring growth. And I have a big, nice list of examples of symbols that I wanted to talk about since the last time where I talked about dreams. Because on the one side, Jung says there is no real handbook for it. So he says dreams don't think highly about dream books. It goes back to this idea of you can't take things literally, you have to take them symbolically, and you also have to always have context, the psychology of the dreamer, their situation, how their consciousness is set up, what is their personality, and so on. So dream interpretation is rather tedious and long with a lot of background knowledge also in mythology, religion, storytelling, and so on. But on this flip side, Jung it's very direct regarding certain symbols and certain images where he says, ah, oh, yeah, this means always that. So on the one hand, he says there is no book, but on the other hand, he acts like symbols have a very fixed meaning. 
if they are of a specific type. So the most standard is the symbol of water, any body of water. It could be the sea, it could be the ocean. This is associated for him with the unconscious as things can disappear in the water or they can suddenly come up. Like fishes, for example, symbolizing thoughts as they can suddenly appear out of nothing, like a thought or an idea you can have. Or fire being associated with libido, the, the animating spirit, same as bodies are warm, uh, which is a, normally is a sign that something is alive, especially for mammals, that it has a body heat that's radiated and then the, the animal dies and then this heat is gone. So you have this association between, ah, you have movement, you have life, and this is associated with heat. And light being associated with consciousness, so you can see conscious things and the dark being associated with the unconscious. And he um, is also pretty open and says, okay, when you dream of animals, those are symbolizing the, the lower levels of psychology. As he says that the psychology of human beings is structured in a way that things are built on top of each other and certain things are just at the bottom where we are similar to, for example, mam other mammals that exist or reptiles, or even insects, or plants. And yeah, that's, that's a good notion. The Indian swastika is also a sun, sign of the sun. So the sun wheels are very old, very ancient, and people have been drawing suns since forever. So you have animals and animals symbolizing not only instincts, but also certain spheres of your consciousness and even parts of your uh, nervous system. For example, Reptiles symbolizing parts of your sympathetic nervous system. And of course, you can also dream or experience certain plants. And his idea about especially the tree was the unfolding of the personality over time for plants and trees, and especially because they're growing and growing over time. So individuation for him is symbolized by a tree. And the unfolding of the personality in individuation is also represented in form of the lotus or of the rose based on where you are because the rose is the lotus of the west and the lotus is the symbol of individuation on the east which is why the next event individuation has as a title the little lotus coming out of the water which is a pretty symbolic picture and fitting for this so everything that's dark and a little bit wet and murky, for example, a dark forest or a cave symbolizing the unconscious, but very often also the feminine aspect because in yin and yang, the yin is female and it's dark and it's associated with the wet side of the mountain. So these associations are conglomerated very often together, very often associated with male and female. And the male, for those who are familiar with tarot, is very associated with, uh, let's say, intellect. So you have this sword cards, and they are all very negative. <laughs> and they are associated with, with the mind and this separating, differentiating part of the mind, because that's what we do. And this is why the hero very often has a sword, because he can skillfully cut apart things secret for example in the german myth he cuts the dragon into pieces uses this as material i think he builds an armor out of the scales for example and this is then what consciousness does it takes this dragon of chaos the unconscious dragon and brings it into usable parts through the intellect through the thought but then you of course you have this feminine aspect which is very often symbolized by the cup because the cup brings things together and holds things together. The female principle for Jung being something that's not separating, like the male principle, but something that's combining and holding together and also sheltering and protecting things. So vases, cups, but also caves being in that regard associated with the female principle. Of course, not one thing is better than the other. Both have their purpose and their things to do. The question is then how to combine both again. This unification process is something that is not really happening in the Western sphere. Jung 
and talked about this a lot. So he was interested in the unification process. You have the opposites. You even have your third um, trying to combine both. But if you look into Western stories, very often the story ends that you kill the dragon, that you beat evil, right? So it's rather a further separation by destroying everything, which is not the other thing. They said this is a rather shortcoming of the Western culture, that it's not integrating the things because the unification is an integration process. It's the growth of consciousness. It's the integration of foreign parts. So you can be afraid of your shadow side, but this does not mean that you should get rid of your shadow side, but rather of finding ways to integrate it into your consciousness because it's part of you missing that's preventing reaching a higher state. So, but if you look into most Western stories, the bad guys get beaten and then they disintegrate or die or whatever. So they get depotentiated, basically. They don't have any more power. But in the East, he says, the stories go a little bit different. In the East, the dragon is a positive sign because in the West, only the negative sign is looked at uh, in the form of the dragon. It has sharp teeth, can fly, it is big, it is strong. It can breathe fire, uh, so it's only death and destruction. That's, uh, so all the Western heroes, like St. Patrick or St. George, they kill snakes, they kill dragons, and that's why they're the heroes. But they are just, let's say, repressed the negative aspects. But in the East, the dragon is a positive symbol because at the same time, something is not purely negative. There's also something positive if it's possible to integrate it, to unify it and bring it together. But that's a very great and difficult trick. So one big unifier for Jung, of course, was Jesus as he, again, like most hero stories, he has parts of both worlds. He is the son of God, but he's also God. And he's the son of man also. So he grew up like a normal human being until he found out that he is the son of God or that he is God and he's trying to leave the world of the sins. But that's the story of, again, having those two worlds being combined in one person. But in the end, he gets killed by human beings. And this is where Jung tried to find more and more in the whole alchemical process to really have a psychological basis with people trying to investigate this shortcomings, say, of Western culture. Not really shortcomings, but let's say earlier stages of ecological development of, of the culture. And she sees alchemy building on top of Christianity and trying to develop those ideas further. The alchemical process is, again, a process of combining things, of unifying things, things that cannot be unified normally. So you try to create a substance which is, what was it? It is hot, cold, moist, and dry. So you have contrasting opposite characteristics that you try to combine into one essence to bring again, bring together incompatible things to reach something of a higher quality because they are all just parts and facets. But in the end, they are the facets of a singular thing. And this thing is supposed to be brought into existence through this process of separation and combining again. So this a chemical process is always they are taken one part and then I try to get it back in and try to recombine it. And this is the whole psychological process is happening inside of people. As soon as you have consciousness, you are in contrast to the world. You are in contrast to the unconscious. It's already a defiance of the world as you now move away from how the world is supposed to be. So when you have animals, they have their instincts and they just follow their instincts and so on. But human beings, we have free will and we can decide what to do. So we can step out of line and do something different. But this, of course, brings into course all those other forces that try to get people back into line. And this is where the tension occurs. And this is where everything happens. And this is how, why you have in stories always these contrasts of a very rich man meeting a poor girl, like in 
pretty woman. <laughs> Where it's then the question, okay, how will they then combine and find together? How will they transform through their interactions? Because most stories are about the interactions and relations between the protagonist and someone else. And through the story being transformed in their personality and in their worldview and everything. And this process happens through the change in mediation through the third and a certain symbol, which is signalizing the way where people are supposed to go to have this bridge to the unconscious and bring these paths into consciousness. So for Jung, all those cultural artifacts, for example, in religion or in storytelling, are supposed to be that bridge into the unconscious to make these unconscious dark things graspable to say okay i'm at least and i have an approximation of something there's not something completely overwhelming coming but rather some training ground of preparation how anger can feel like and how love can feel like and how it looks like and how it's supposed to interact with the rest of the world this is why you had in the greek in the ancient greek mythology all those emotions symbolized by persons like Ares for war and Aphrodite for love and Athena for wisdom to have approximation. Okay, they are like this. They get characterized. They have a personality and you see how they're interacting in their stories to give people an approximation to their own psychology and how to just order things because ordering is already a conscious process and culture is supposed to support this but for Jung this connection is diminished since mm, Nietzsche's <laughs> death of God which is due to this deep potentiation of symbol cultural symbols that don't have the same meaning anymore that don't generate the same fascination they become stale they're just copied and copied and copied so they have to be believed instead of being believed all by themselves so suddenly faith becomes this really conscious effort, willfully effort of, I, I have to believe this. And then I'm so convinced by it that I don't question it. So, but he says humanity and especially the West has developed in a direction where new symbols are necessary to explain this new psychological needs and ground that is now there. So with time, these symbols will come up very likely individual and, and persons, many different persons at the same time in their dreams, in their visions, in their fantasies. And they will try to bring them out into the world uh, where they will reach other persons again and it can become a unifying symbol that then gives meaning. Of course, this can be something then like the swastika, which was really not a good thing to come out of the unconscious, which was horrible, but which can, in a let's say positive light be something that is more unifying to people and i hope i was clear and be understandable what i tried to get at with the opposites with the third and with the unification which are a very very fundamental principle for jung and how the, the psyche experiences the world and is changed through existence in the world and how it is changed and can change itself and yeah i want to thank you <laughs> for listening this was this event's topic thanks for tuning in during an event a discussion part follows after the presentation where all attendees discuss the just presented topic or other jungian concepts if you also want to join find the group on meetup.com the name of the group is cg jung help desk also make sure to subscribe to the podcast on the platform of your choice see you next time